everyone. Thanks so much, Steve. It is such an honor to be here before you and to have the privilege to introduce our keynote speaker of the hour for our Friday Forum. Charles Weathers is an astute professional, a successful entrepreneur, and a friend to all he encounters, including myself. I am indebted to Charles, and I have told him this several times. You see, back in April of 2014, he pulled me out of a very precarious situation that I want to share just a little bit with you about. I was preparing to host about maybe 500 individuals at the TV Convention Center for one of our annual events. It was the ACE Leadership Symposium, which is all about advancing multicultural leadership. So as we typically do, we always secure our keynote speaker well in advance, and there was no difference in this particular situation. So the afternoon prior, I received a call from the keynote speaker's executive assistant, who proceeded to share with me that our speaker would not be able to make it because he was sick. So, being the concerned, compassionate person that I am, my immediate question was, just how sick is he? <laughs> Can he stand and utter a few words, perhaps? <laughs> Clearly, that wasn't the case. So I called up Charles. He immediately came to mind. I explained the situation, and without hesitation, he said, yes, I'll do it. I have your back. Glad to help. No worries. Not only did my friend Sir Charles, as I like to affectionately call him, have my back, but he delivered a phenomenal presentation on building collaborative relationships to advance leadership diversity. And it was so rich and substantive that every one of the 500 guests in the audience presumed that he had prepared this for months in advance. I knew at the conclusion of that day that he was meant to be on our stage and that we would want him back. And I'm so fortunate that today presents that opportunity. Some of his points that he presented that day that resonated with so many of us included do what you can with what you have where you are. He shared that it's time to put silos to bed and to form alliances. Helping people helps all people. Charles showed us that we need to lose the thinking that helping multicultural professionals or other underserved individuals helps just that group, but it helps us all. He challenged us to determine who is going to replace the existing minority leadership, indicating that the same 20% of minorities serve on our local boards. And if we want to advance leadership, we must move behind the usual suspects. And we can hire diverse people if we diversify our circles. He noted that our eyes will open to the wealth of resources that exist in our community if we just look, and look very intently. Charles told us that we fail not because of a lack of skill, but because of lack of will. And he encouraged us to hold each other accountable. His presentation stressed that no collaboration or alliance can exist without trust, and that every person who works in your organization, you have said to the public you trust that person. Charles also stressed the importance of relationship building, indicating that organizations don't have relationships. People do. In addition to Sir Charles becoming my hero in April of 2014, he is also a decorated veteran having served nine years in the United States Air Force, a nationally known speaker, writer, and consultant, a recognized authority on leadership, organizational effectiveness, and performance improvement, and Charles has become known for his strategic intellect and engaging intensity, which you'll soon hear. Charles' ability to educate while entertaining audiences at all levels has earned him the respect of industry leaders in the nonprofit, government, and the private sectors. As founder of the Weathers Group, a management consulting firm based in Columbia, South Carolina, he strives to develop leaders and strategies that improve an organization's performance. His background includes two decades of board leadership and service, 15 years as a fundraising professional, and six years in the private sector. In addition, he has more than a decade of experience as a successful business entrepreneur and serves as a proud father and model of four children. Help me to welcome my friend, and soon your friend, Sir Charles Weathers. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope someone recorded that. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have had plenty of introductions over the years, but I can, I've never had an introduction like that, Nika. I am humbled, and I just feel like sitting down and eating right now and just relaxing, because we're done at that point. Seriously, though, thank you. Interesting. 
her introduction, you, you, you highlighted all the speech from a year and a half ago and the things we talked about. And it just reminded me as she was doing that, it's lucky I have new material today. <laughs> I was like, don't take my talking points, but I have new material today, so we're, we're good. <clears throat> but in all seriousness, let me just say this before I get into this. The Chamber here in Greenville is an awesome, awesome organization. You do phenomenal things for the Chamber in the community. You're so awesome that, as an example, my office is based out of Columbia, South Carolina. That's where I'm located in Columbia. But I'm a member of the Greenville Chamber. I mean, the Chamber does so many great things that even though I'm in Columbia, I said, I have to be a member of the Greenville Chamber. And people have said to me, well, are you moving to Greenville? I said, not yet. Let me stay in Columbia a little while longer, but it's worth me investing in what you're doing here. And you have people like Nika who are doing phenomenal things on the front end, making things happen. So we get a lot of business from working with the Chamber and a lot of notoriety. And the people like my friend Lori right here who do great things in the community. So many people here that are doing things beyond the call of duty to make Greenville a better place. And I just want to thank you all for your service to the community. Thank you to the sponsors. Thank you for those that are being here today. So let's just jump right in because we're going to have a great conversation. I hope we do at least talking about something we entitled the Connected Conversation. Let me prepare you. Six days from now, about six days from now, many of us will convene around a table somewhere somewhere. And there'll be plenty of food, there'll be plenty of football, there'll be plenty of fellowship, and there'll be plenty of conversations. And it's interesting, some of us are really looking forward to these conversations next Thursday. <laughs> and some of us who have an uncle like I aren't too sure we're looking forward to those conversations. <laughs> but we realize we're going to engage in the conversation. And I use next Thursday, Thanksgiving as an example, of having a conversation because there's no better time of year to talk about connected conversations than during the holidays. But I'm not going to talk just personally, I'm going to talk professionally. The value of having these conversations. Now let me share something with you. If I had one purpose, one point I want you to walk away with from my brief time with you today, it is simply this. I want to encourage you to leave here and talk with someone. It's that simple. I want to encourage you to leave here and have a conversation with someone. I don't know who that someone is, but I can promise you, everyone in this room, there's someone in your circle right now that you need to have a conversation with. Personally, professionally, somewhere in your world, there's someone you need to have a conversation with that you've yet to have. And I want to encourage you to have that conversation. Now, let me tell you why. For the last 13 years of my life, my professional life, I spent my time facilitating, mediating, or moderating conversations. It's not normally presented as neatly or clearly as this. For years, I didn't even realize that was what I was really doing. If you were to say to me, Charles, what do you do? What are you doing? What's your work? What's your job like? I'd say things like, I do strategic planning. I'd say things like team building. I, I do things with diversity. Maybe some conflict resolution. Sprinkle in a little individual executive coaching in there. That's what I do. But I realized, actually, that was the outcome. Those were the products. Those were the results of what I did. I always talked about work in terms of the product or the outcome. Then I realized the most important part of what I did was the conversation. It was the process. The process of the conversation the process of facilitating, mediating, or moderating the development of a plan, or helping a county council define their priorities when there were political differences that would not allow them to talk to each other, helping a law firm reduce turnover of paralegals and staff because there was some, a toxic environment and people didn't know how to communicate with each other, so we thought it was somebody else's fault, so we just kept firing people when we didn't get along with them. Walking business partners through a breakup because they stayed together in what one said, this is basically an unconsummated divorce. Why won't we leave each other? But we stayed together for years because no one wanted to talk about it. We would not have the conversation. The key component to the process across the board is we must have meaningful conversations. The conversation is the key to success. The conversation is the key to your business success. I'll prove it to you. I'm going to put one visual up here on the board, and this will stay here the entire time that I talk. Results. I don't know much about your business individually right now. You may work for a government agency, you may work with a nonprofit, you may work 
for a corporate entity, you may work for a small business, you may volunteer. But I promise you, at the end of the day, at the end of the week, the one thing everyone in this room has in common, we are looking for some results. There's some outcome, some achievement, some attainment, something we want to make happen. We don't want to be busy doing nothing. We want some results. We want to see something move, move a needle, measure an outcome. Relationships, the depth of our relationships, have a direct impact on the depth of our results. And the depth of our conversations have a direct uh, impact on the depth of our relationships. When we often talk about results with an organization or a company, people go straight to, let's look at our internal management processes. And that's a good thing. Results. We'll look at some of the products we're producing. Results. We'll sit down and we'll look at different trainings we offer. Results. I think the two most important components of producing results are the conversations and the relationships that exist within an organization. When we're called in, we spend most, most of our time right here having conversations or getting people to talk with each other and dealing with relationships. That's the key to success. The other things are important, but we cannot forget the depth of the conversation and the depth of relationships and the results that come from that. Nika gave an example of when she called me back in April of 2014. Now what she may not know, and this is not because I'm a big deal because I'm not a big deal, but I will share this with you. I would not have done that for just anybody. The day before a phone call, you want me to do a keynote speech to 500 people on huh, what, to, to, why, why did that happen? It happened because Nika and I had a relationship that allowed her to realize those results that day. But our relationship didn't just form out of the thin air. Our relationship was based on a series of conversations that we had, meaningful conversations, in-depth conversations. We got to know each other, transparent conversations. And therefore, she was at a point where she knew, I could pick up the phone and I can call Charles. That's it. Not because he liked her better than somebody else, not because she was so special, because we had a conversation and relationships that, watch this, put us in position to get results. If you're not having the right conversations and you're not developing the right relationships, ladies and gentlemen, you can invest all you want into your business. You won't get the results that you should get without the conversation and without the relationships. We're often called into situations where people aren't talking with each other, they're talking to each other. Everything is assumed to be fine because no one is complaining. You ever heard that one? Everything's good here. How do you know everything's good? Because nobody's complaining. Someone ought to say something, but I don't want to say it. So as Charles is walking in the door, they're slipping me notes in my bag <laughs> or sending me anonymous emails. Can you say such and such to so and so? Because I can't say it. Someone ought to say something, Charles, just not me. I literally have people who want to hire us. They'll call me up and say, can you come and say this for me? <laughs> I said, you're actually going to pay me to come say what you should say. Think about that for a second. Because it's not a space where they're willing to have or able to have the connected conversations. <clears throat> the one thing all these things have in common, a conversation was required to reach the result. I spend the better part of my day helping people have those conversations. And I'm going to share some things with you to help you have those conversations without me. Because I'm going to share something with you. I don't think anybody in this room is walking around with a facilitator, mediator, or moderator in your pocket. So... <laughs> You need some tips, some tools, something that can help you engage these conversations when you leave here today. So what is a connected conversation? Simply this. It's an open, meaningful, constructive dialogue. I keep it very simple. A connected conversation is an open, meaningful, constructive dialogue. Now, what do I mean by that? I, I really believe in defining important terms. So let me see if we can make sense of all this. An open dialogue means that the people that are engaged in the conversation are willing and open to having the conversation. It is very difficult to have a connected conversation with someone that does not want to talk with you. That's very difficult. Also, people in an open environment are listening to understand, not listening to respond. Connected conversations rely on our ability and our willingness, again, not just to listen, but to listen to understand. Does anybody remember playing uh, double dutch as a child? Anybody do that? You know, the double dutch game and you, double dutch is an interesting game because you had two people on the side and you turn in the rope like this, remember that? If you played double dutch? Well, double dutch <coughs> was also a game of timing. 
timing. You couldn't just jump in the rope, right? You had to time that thing perfectly. And I, I was never good at double dutch, but I would try to do it. And what people would do, I'd watch them, I'd admire them. They're turning that rope and the person who's about to jump in, they would stand by the side and position themselves kind of like this. They'd get like this and they start rocking back and forth. Cause the rope, and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to coordinate and get myself to the rhythm of the rope right there. So I see the space. See, some of y'all did this before, right? And then when the, when, when the space is just right, I jump in and then I start doing my double dutch dance and jumping the rope. That's what we did. A lot of people have double dutch conversations. And what they do is as you're talking, they're not listening to understand, they're listening to respond. And I'm just listening and you're talking and I'm like this right here. And all I'm waiting for is for you to take a breath. And as soon as you take a breath, <laughs> as soon as you hesitate, as soon as you pause, I jump right in. That's a double dutch conversation. And that's not an open conversation because I'm not here to listen to you. I'm here to say what I came to say. Open also means, watch this, open also means that we're transparent. I speak my truth. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot tell you how often I am in an environment with someone who is work in a workplace and they cannot speak their truth. They just can't. I can't speak my truth here. So it's not an open environment. It's not a space where I can do that. The other component of the, of the connected conversation, it's meaningful. In other words, we talk about the deep stuff. There's substance there. It's relevant. We're not just talking to talk. We want to get to the meat of the matter. Those are the connected conversations. We've got to get out of the shallow end of the pool. We've got to get our teams together and start having the hard conversations. We've got to talk about the things that we don't want to talk about. Every story I tell you today has happened, but like the old Dragnet television show, I'll change the names to protect the innocent. So I'm sitting down with a gentleman who is 74 years old, and there's nothing wrong with being 74. That's a great age. And I say to the gentleman who's 74 years old, how long have you been running this business? And he tells me how many years he's been running it. And I said to him one simple question. I said, who's next? He said, huh? I said, after you, who's next? Who's going to take over? How long are you going to do this? He said, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. At some point, at some time. All of his partners, his management team, everyone is sitting in the corner huddling trying to figure out who's next. What's going to happen next? What's going to happen? But we can't talk about it because if we talk about it, it'll upset him and then he'll think we want to get rid of him and it's mutiny. So we just sit around and we're waiting. And I said, waiting for what? Are you waiting for him to die? Now think about it. Doesn't that sound cruel? Doesn't that sound cruel? But guess what? That's what they're waiting for. Because what else is going to happen? And then at that point, you're going to do something. But it's the conversation that no one's willing to have. So they get together and they talk about very shallow, superficial things because the deep things are sometimes hard and difficult. But I'm going to show you today that you have to have those deep, hard, difficult conversations. And the last part, the part I love about connected conversations, they're constructive. Now, here's the visual for constructive. Go to any day school, any preschool, any, any school with, you say, two, three, four-year-olds, and remember those little blocks we played with as children? Well, when I was a child, they were wooden. Now they're plastic, I think. But you take those little blocks, if you put some kids together in a circle, you'll find kids will construct something with those blocks. One child will take a block and put it down, and another child will take a block and either put it on top of it or put it next to it. And if you leave them there long enough, they'll build or do something with those blocks. Your conversations are just like those children with the building blocks. Every word you speak, every word I speak, should build on the previous word. Every statement I make, every sentence I speak, should build on what someone else just said. In other words, we are connecting things together as we're having this conversation. And ladies and gentlemen, this takes work, this takes time, this takes focus, and this takes intention. Because I have to listen to what you're saying and then tie what you're saying into what I'm saying. It's constructive. Think of it this way. It's like two people with one needle and one thread. And when you're speaking, you have the needle and thread in your hand and I'm watching you. But then when it's my turn to speak, you hand me the needle and thread and I keep it going throughout the entire course. That's how you build a conversation together. And that's what's lacking. And that's what I see a challenge in many businesses across the state and across the country. Connected conversations will reduce confusion. They'll add clarity. And trust me, they're uncomfortable. I'm going to say that right now. It's uncomfortable because we have not been taught how to do this. 
They are the hardest, most fulfilling, life-changing, disruptive conversations you'll ever have. Didn't I just sell that one? Wow. <laughs> That's what they are. And here's why we have to have them. Here's why I'm begging you to have them. Here's why I think it's a business imperative to have them. Because we're surrounded by disconnected, detached conversations that are becoming the norm. And we have to push back against that. Think about this. Have you ever been in this meeting? Five people sitting around a table. We're all meeting and someone says something. And the next person says, you've heard this line before, to, bit, to piggyback on that, y'all heard that one, right? To piggyback on that, or we'll say, in line with that, we'll say that as well, or we'll say, to tie into that, and then we'll say what we have to say. What I've learned is many times, the next statement after to piggyback on that normally has nothing to do with that. <laughs> when we say to piggyback on that, in line with that, to tie into that, usually that's just our social norm of acknowledging, you said something, but now here's what I wanna say. We're not piggybacking, tying to, or doing any of that. We're just saying what we wanna say. The truth is, we have mastered the art of monologues in group meetings, and group settings. We don't get engaged in dialogue, we engage in monologue. Five people come in a room, we meet for an hour, we hear five different monologues, dialogue did not take place. And we all leave and wonder, how can we keep having the same meeting over and over again? You ever been there? How can we keep having the same meeting over and over again? We're challenged with our meetings and we'll look at the agenda, we'll look at, we'll change the meeting time, we'll change the meeting location. I'm gonna share something with you. Conversation, conversation is the oil that makes a meeting run smoothly. You can have the best meeting location, the best meeting facility, meet at the ideal time, have the correct participants in that room, but if you're not engaging in the right conversation, it stalls. And what we do is we blame the meeting. It's the meeting, no it's not the meeting, it's the conversation or the lack thereof. How about this? Debate has become the conversation method of choice. Yes, there's a time and place to debate, but everything does not have to be a debate. Everything does not have to be a win-lose. You ever have a conversation with a spouse that you should be having with a coworker? Now just think about that. You ever gone home and talked to your spouse about something that's happening at work? Now, it's okay to bounce things off of your spouse or your significant other, that's, but if you're talking to your spouse about something for the last year that you should have said to John at work, and you haven't said anything to John, we got a problem. Or have you ever done this? Have you ever had a conversation with someone else, but they're never present when you have that conversation with them? <laughs> I would do that often, driving in the car on the way home. I'm talking to you right now. You're right here, and I'm, I'm telling you what I gotta tell you. <laughs> and it's really good, too, but you're never there when I'm telling you this. <laughs> Again, it's okay to rehearse what you might wanna say to somebody, but at some point, you got to include the other person in the conversation that you're having with them. OK, consider that. Here's one of my favorites. Here's one of my favorites, uh, the disconnected conversation. You've seen this at work. Person A has a problem or a challenge with person B. we got a challenge. There's some conflict, real or perceived, but we have a challenge here. We're not connecting here. So person A has a challenge with person B. So what does person A do? Person A goes to person C and says, what's wrong with person B? <laughs> I don't go to person B, because that would require me being a little bit more direct. Watch this, person C does not, they don't know what's going on with person A and B, so what does person C do? They go to person D, what's wrong with A and B? <laughs> By the time it's all said and done, we've talked to everybody except person B. <laughs> and they're walking around like, I thought everything was okay, I didn't know anybody had a problem, but nobody talked with them. Okay? Think about your work environment. Has the elephant in the room gotten so big that you can no longer get in the room? I see that all the time. That proverbial elephant, we can't talk about that, but if you don't deal with it at some point, that elephant grows and grows and grows and you can no longer get in the room. Here's my favorite. My favorite evidence of not having connected conversations. Did you know in the world of human resources, the number one dress code violation in this country is flip-flops? Now, <laughs> flip-flops. Now, some of you know what I'm talking about. You're going to start. I cannot tell you the amount of times I get called in because somebody won't wear the right shoes. 
You have 100 people working on, on the floor, 100 people. You know you can't wear flip-flops. One person keeps wearing flip-flops to work. Instead of talking to that one person, we send all 100 people to a two-day flip-flop remedial training course. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> That's what we do. Put it in the training budget. We need flip-flop training. <laughs> It's only one person, <laughs> and we all know who that one person is. And 99 people are walking in that training class saying, why don't you just talk to her or him? <laughs> but we don't do that. <laughs> we have drive-by conversa drive conversations. I love the drive-by conversation. You know the drive-by conversation. You're coming in while I'm going out, and we're just throwing stuff back and forth with each other. Hope you catch it, hope you caught it. And you know when you're having drive-by conversations, when you get to a certain point, you say, did I say that? When did I say that? Did I mean, that's not what I meant, I meant this. Because we're moving at such a fast pace, we're not taking the time to talk. We have to stop looking at conversation as an obstacle to our work. We have to stop looking at conversation as something extra to what we do. Conversation is the means by what we, or how we do what we do. It's through the conversation that the work gets done. That's the key. I think connected conversations are necessary for the success of your business. If we want to fix it, Whatever needs to be fixed, we must engage in a connected conversation. Imagine, imagine a marriage that's on the rocks, a marriage that's challenged, and we want to fix this marriage, but we don't want to talk. Let's fix it without talking about it. What are our chances of success? Imagine a business, an organization, a team. We have some conflict. We got some toxicity. We have a challenge in here. Let's do whatever we can, but let's not talk about it. The number one option that we choose, instead of talking about something, we send somebody to a training class. Now you're talking to a person who facilitates training classes for a living, so I'm not trying to put myself out of business. There is a need for professional development. But we don't use professional development to replace just real, authentic, genuine conversations that you as leaders and managers should be equipped to have. So professional development should not become the scapegoat for, I don't want to talk about it. Just send them to a class, let somebody else deal with it, and I hope they come back fixed. It doesn't work that way. I guarantee you, there are communities right now that are struggling. Communities, entire communities that are struggling because two grown adults that have the resources and the authority within their realm won't play nice in the sandbox together. You know of instances where two organizations did not work together, not because the organization did not want to, but two people in power wouldn't talk to each other. And the unfortunate thing when that happens, they don't suffer, the community suffers. I am sure, pretty sure, that we can't fix anything without talking about it. So here are a few principles as I close I wanna share with you. Principle number one, always remember this. Conversations are the most common form of collaboration in the workplace. When you have a conversation with somebody, you are modeling collaboration. A conversation is a joint venture, it's mutually beneficial, we're working on this thing together. Conversations are the most common form of collaboration. This is why many businesses, you talk about collaborations, alliances, and partnerships, one reason we can't form external collaborations, alliances, and partnerships, of course, internally we don't have them. You can't collaborate with somebody you're not talking to. Conversations, connected conversations, require the sender to remain responsible and accountable for the message. I can't be like the little kid putting the blocks together and some other kid comes in and throws a block and knocks it over and walks away like, I don't know what happened to your little building over there. Every time you put a word into a conversation, you're putting another block on the table. You're building something. And your words either build or they tear down. You consciously can make a choice of what you're going to say and how you're going to say it. I'll give you a simple example, a simple change in phraseology that's made a difference in some organizations. One, one businessman used to go into his office, he would say to people, what's wrong? What's wrong? That is the worst question, what's wrong? Because people, nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong. He switched it. Instead of saying, what's wrong, he began to say this, what could be better? Now that might sound corny to you, but changing that one question, because for instance, what's wrong makes me focus on the negative, what could be better makes me see the bright spot. 
It makes me look for something that's aspirational. And that one question changed the content of the conversations that he was having with his staff and his team. Another line that someone used that you can feel free to use is they began sentences by saying this. They would say, I should tell you blank. And now it was I should I should tell you. And what it, did, it put themselves in a vulnerable position instead of coming in saying this. They said, you know, what? I should tell you or I should share something with you. The word share opens up people to conversations because it presents it as something that I want to give you, not something I want to do to you. So when you say, may I share something with you? Sure. What is that? That's now opened the door for a more open, meaningful, connected conversation and dialogue. If you want to have connected conversations with people, stop telling and start asking more. We spend a lot of time going into meetings telling people things. I'm going to share something with you. Sometimes even when you know the answer, you have to start asking the questions. Asking questions to help people own the answers themselves. Then they connect with it. They own it. Meetings aren't the only time when we should be having a conversation. If you have to wait to a meeting to talk with someone, we have a problem. Conversation should be taking place throughout the course of regular business. It shouldn't be something that's reserved. We only talk during meetings here. We're talking continually throughout the course of what we do. Another tip is be in the moment and remove all distractions. Now, let me share something with you. I love technology. I am not here to tell you get rid of phones and get rid of Twitter and Facebook and so on. I love all of that. I use all of that. I access all of that. But when I talk about removing the noise and being in the moment, I'm talking about is this conversation, is this space a priority in my life right now? You can't have a connected conversation if this space and this time, this conversation aren't a priority right now. You've got to be in that moment, diligently work hard to stay in that moment. And the last point I want to make for the connected conversation. It's OK to have an agenda when you go into a meeting. Now, this might surprise you. I'm going to say this. It's OK to have an agenda. It's the hidden agenda that's the problem. Some of the most meaningful meetings I've been a part of facilitating, mediating and so on are when people come to the table and say, let me tell you what my interests are. Let me tell you what I want to get out of this right here. Let me tell you what my department needs. Let me tell you what we have going on. By doing that, we put it all on the table and we can help each other get what we want. There's an interesting thing that happened. Imagine an engineering department, a sales department, and a finance department all sitting together having a conversation. Now, I don't know if you know, and this is going to sound kind of stereotypical, but in my line of work and what I've seen over the years, you can pretty much say, or people will say, salespeople think a certain way. You ever heard that term? Sales, sales, they, you think like a salesperson. And then folks say, you think like an engineer. Engineers, or you accounting money people, you just do things a little bit differently. That may not account to everybody, but it's a stereotype that survived the years. And what was happening in this one organization, the engineering, sales, and budgeting, accounting department were all coming together meeting, and nothing was happening because each department, though there was a common vision, though there was a common mission, the truth is each department had their own agenda. Salespeople wanted something to happen. They wanted something to happen. Engineering, they wanted, no, this has to happen. The budgeting folks said, this can or won't happen. And what happened was, without putting all that on the table, people were having conversations in the dark. Because no one sat down at the beginning and said, tell me what your real interests are. What do you want to get out of this? How can this benefit you? That opened up a whole realm of a connected conversation that changed the way they did business. So instead of coming in saying, this is what I want from you, it started with, let me tell you what I need. Let me tell you what I'm here to offer. And that changed the whole dialogue of the conversation. Here's the bottom line. You can choose to not talk with people. You can keep talking at them. You can choose to do that. You can choose to use texting and email, instant messaging, and Facebook posts as the primary means of communication. That'll work. You can do that. But I'm going to share something with you. I believe in my heart of hearts that in the next five years, the number one course or topic in demand in the world of professional development is going to be old school, the art of communication. I promise. I see that trend already. Corporations, businesses, entities, are going to be calling people, come in and teach us how to talk with each other. Come in and teach us how to dialogue. That's what's going to happen. And don't blame this on the millennials or Generation Z. Don't blame it on them, because we all play a role in it. What's your role going to be? You can either watch it happen, or you can make it happen. It's your choice. But I encourage you today, leave here, go have a conversation with somebody, and connect with them and get some results.
Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I do believe we have a few minutes for some questions. Uh, so if you would, just raise your hand if you have a question. I'll kind of call on you, and, uh, and uh, we'll take the next few minutes to kind of get some of these questions answered. And I think our first one's right here. Thank you. Great question. Thank you for asking that. So how do you initiate that difficult conversation? <clears throat> Excuse me. The first thing that you do is you initiate the conversation with I. I tell people all the time, you have to learn to use your I language. See, most difficult conversations start with you. Let me tell you what you did to me. Let me tell you what you got wrong. And as soon as you did, see, when you go you, when you begin to criticize and come at somebody like that, you cause a couple things to happen. You cause them, number one, to defend their position. Even if they're wrong, they'll defend it. And number two, you cause them to strike back at you. Now you're, you're going you, 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 you. That's all you're going. The difficult conversation starts with I. I. Can I share something about how I feel? Now, the next thing, though, is here's what we have a challenge with. Normally when we say I feel, we then finish that sentence with not a feeling, but with a fact. <laughs> and then we say, when we say I think, we don't end that with something intellectual, we end that with a feeling. So when you say I feel, you know, I'm feeling a little discouraged at work, and let me tell you why. It seems to me that when I do that, you see the difference? Now I'm owning my feelings, I'm not putting it on you. That's, what, that's the first way to start it. And again, I can share more with you after this, but that's a quick one. Okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, ma'am. Sometimes I spend the better part of my week facilitating sessions like that. But let me, I'll give you five quick things that you can do. When you get a group of people together like that, different departments, different styles, and so on, consider this. Ask each group or each individual in that room, number one, what is your role in this current effort? What role are you going to play? So budgeting has a role. Engineering has a role. Marketing has a role. Sales have a role. Don't assume people know this. Assumptions will kill conversations. So number one, figure out everybody's role. Next thing, what are your interests? Find out, what, when I say interest, the thing that you focus on, the thing you care about, what's most important to you? I'm interested in this. Then ask the departments, what do you value? Now we have corporate values, but when you have that conversation, I'm asking people this. Tell me the non-negotiables that you won't compromise. Budgeting values certain things, don't they? <laughs> Engineering, they value certain things. Sales, I'm not gonna compromise. We need to know that going into conversation. Then the, la the next one is, what are your expectations of us? What do you expect us to do to help you get to where you need to get? And then finally, what responsibility will you be held accountable for in this conversation or in this effort? By asking those five questions, what you've done is you kind of removed the person and focused on the roles, the interests, the values, the expectations, and the rights. So it's not me versus you. We put all that in a pot together, and then we find our common ground. That's a quick tip for you. You're welcome. Question? We have time for about one more. Uh, 
She's asking, if you're in the workplace and you have to have a difficult conversation with someone, and there's a pretty big power differential, how do you have that work, how do you have that conversation? The first question I would have to ask is, what does your organizational structure look like? And I'm gonna tell you why structure is important in that case. There are some organizations that have such a firm and strong hierarchy that depending on how many levels there are between you and that person, just by having a conversation, you'll be deemed as being insubordinate. And that'll tell me something about the culture of that organization that we need to take into consideration. So the first thing that you have to do is that if there's the big power structure, you have to ask yourself, can I have this conversation in a safe space without threatening somebody else's position? So let's say you worked, I, I, I work for you, okay, and I want to get to my friend here. If I bypass you, you might feel like, Charles, you're breaking the chain of command. You can't do that. So I might have to ask you permission to go talk to someone else and have that conversation. The other thing is, write it down. I believe sometimes you can, you can prepare for a conversation by writing down your concern and sharing it with that person beforehand to help kind of till the field before you get into the depth of the conversation. That's one way. That, that's great. How often do you do net night? Quarterly. <laughs> Have you ever been to net night? Have you ever been to net night, the event that the chamber? Well, we need to promote net night <laughs> because net night is an event that's run by the chamber that focuses just on that. And Nick, I forget what you call the folks. Are they ambassadors? Who are the people that talk, talk about that for a quick second? Because I think that addresses that. And one thing they do is they, I uh, went to a few of them, they have a list of questions to help bridge conversations and get conversations started. And one other thing I'll say about the networking idea, I think one, re one way we get networking wrong is we think networking is passing a business card to somebody else. That's not networking, that's just card passing. <laughs> that's just card passing. And also when we network, we're so afraid to talk about what we really want. I'm okay saying to you, hey, how you doing? My name is Charles. Let's talk about how maybe I can help you and how maybe you can help me. Maybe we can't. What's the worst thing that can happen? We've developed a new friendship or relationship. That's the worst thing that can happen. But when you go in kind of secretively, I'm going to get their money without talking about it. People know what we want. Let's talk about it. <laughs> we know what we want. Talk about it. Put it out. Be transparent. <laughs> Very good. Let me, let, me, let me ask you to please join me in a round of applause and thank Charles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Charles, it's our tradition to give all of our guest speakers, and it's a, particularly a privilege to give this to you today, because what a way to end our speaker series for 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I think I have a man crush. I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> Steve. <laughs> I do, too. <laughs> <laughs> the book, Reimagining Greenville, who's authored by our mayor, Knox White, and our own John Boyanowski, and is personalized by both the authors. And I'd like to present this to you, um, uh, Sir Charles, for coming and sharing with us today. Thank and we you. thank you so much Appreciate for your time. Appreciate that, my friend. Thank you.